dive in and then we'll see. Differentials. is basically, in one sense, an alternative way of thinking about linearization. But um, the mechanics of it are different. So let's remind ourselves what linearization is and why you'd use it in most real-world situations, or a lot of real-world situations, I should say. There are other applications. But say you have a function, and you know what the function is doing on an interval because, well, because you have data on that interval, and you want to predict what the function will be doing slightly outside that interval. So you are a hospital administrator during the epidemic, you're looking at COVID cases, you're trying to guess how many admissions you'll have tomorrow so that you can bring new um, more people in if necessary, or try to free up machines if necessary. You have data, you have admissions data for the COVID epidemic up to now, but now you're trying to predict what will happen in the future. The way that linearization tries to help us with that is we can take a point and we can linearize through the point and near the point in question, the function looks like its linearization. I mean, obviously, looks like is not a formal math term, but we saw this yesterday, zooming in on graphs. So if this value we're interested in is sufficiently close to the point we're linearizing around, we can use the linearization to estimate the curve, and we can therefore use the linearization to try to predict the future, to try to guess what the admissions will be tomorrow if we know what they've been up till now. The differential is also, in one sense, a way of doing this. The way the differential approaches this question is different, though. The differential says, okay, you have this point here this x0 comma y0, and you're trying to use it to predict the future. What we're going to do is draw a right triangle. And um, we're going to label the sides of this right triangle dx and dy. And we're going to give the differential formula, which is as follows. dy equals the derivative at x sub zero times dx. 
and we're going to say, okay, so when x equals x sub zero plus dx <coughs> y equals y sub zero plus dy. And it needs to be understood that just as with differentials, sorry, just as with the linearization, this is an approximation. It's not exact. It would be more proper for me to use the approximately equal to symbol for that y. When x equals x plus x, when x equals x is 0 plus dx, y is approximately equal to y0 plus dy. And maybe this is a little cryptic when you see it written out, um, especially maybe what we have here is kind of cramped and hard to read. But this is the same situation that we would use linearization in. We've been looking at a curve over some interval. We'll call the last value of that interval x sub zero. We want to predict what happens outside of the interval. We want to predict what happens over there. So this value is the x0 plus dx that appears in the previous frame. This distance between the last value we know and the value we're interested in, that distance is dx. And we know what the function is doing on the interval. So we know the x value, x sub zero, and we know the y value, y sub zero. The way that we're attempting to predict to the future, the way that we're attempting to determine what happens over here at x sub zero is to sketch in a right triangle whose hypotenuse is the tangent line. The fact that the hypotenuse is the tangent line isn't necessary to do this process, but it is true. Using the formula on the previous frame, we can try to find that vertical distance. And then we can say <coughs> what we said on the previous frame. When x equals x sub zero plus dx. So this value that we're interested in, y 
equals or approximately equals y sub zero plus dy. And as with basically anything in calculus, maybe anything in sort of mathematics in general, this really is crying out for an example to try to nail home what we're doing. And these examples, I sort of touched on this yesterday, are always going to be pretty artificial because we don't want to give students a bunch of data and then ask them to do some kind of regression. In this introductory class, we want to have a nice formula to work. With. So let's say we have this function, <coughs> and let's say we want to use differentials to try to approximate. the square root of 4.0017. And we're using the fact that we know the square root of 4 is 2. So I haven't used the phrase linearize around a point. I haven't explicitly mentioned any point period, but this is sort of the basis of what we're trying to do. And the argument we're making is this. We've got this point four, comma, two. We've got this value that we're interested in, 4.0017. So this distance, dx, is dx equals zero point zero zero one seven. We're going to find dy using the differential, and then we're going to have as our solution. Y is zero plus dy. Two plus dy will be our approximation of this y value. And to find dy, Where the differential formula go? Here it is. To find dy, we take a derivative. We use this differential formula, dy equals f prime of x dx. To help remember the differential formula, It might help to remember that dy dx and f prime of x 
are just different ways of writing the derivative. On the left, you have Leibniz notation. On the right, you have the Grange notation. And that dy dx isn't really a fraction per se. It's just a piece of notation. But if you treated it like a fraction and multiplied both sides of the equality by dx, you'd basically get the differential notation. And you'd be missing the sub-zero. But that's how I always remember the differential. So dy equals f prime of x zero dx. In the particular case, where f of x is the square root of x, x sub zero is four, and dx is zero point zero zero one seven one seven one seven. And at this point, you're basically plugging and playing. I mean, you need to find the derivative. You need to find f prime of x. You now are going to take x sub 0 and plug it in. And when we do, we get four. Uh, the square root of four is two. So two times two is four. And one of these days, I'll remember to bring this calculator up before we need it, but not today. All that remains is to do, okay, I was going to keep writing. I forgot that I can't do that because the calculator covers up the screen. Give it a moment. So now we have one fourth and we have 0 0.0017. So as for dy, all that's left is to take 0 0.0017 and divide it by 4, and we get point zero, 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 four, two, five. Remember what this scientific notation means. It says to take this period and move it to the left four times. And that will give point zero, 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 four, two, five. Finally, we complete this. We want 2 plus dy. Well, that's 2 point zero 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 four two five, and that 
is our approximation. Is our approximation any good? Yeah, it's, wow, I hadn't intended to, but somehow I just sort of pulled from my subconscious the exact, uh, the exact example we did yesterday with linearizations. I now see we did the square root of 4.0017 using linearizations, and we got 2.000425. We did it using differentials, and we get the same thing, um, 2.000425. It looks like we're getting different things, but that's just um, a rounding thing. Um, I always think that differentials, when you view it in this light, come across as kind of cryptic. I mean, we learn one way of doing an approximation. That's the linearization. And then we learn another way of doing an approximation. That's the differentials. But to me, the differentials are much less intuitive than the linearization. And why do we need two different ways of doing an approximation anyway, if they're going to give us the exact same answer? So I think this is, I mean, this is an act way of presenting these differentials. Probably a more useful or perhaps a more intuitive way of understanding differentials is a measurement of error. Differentials can be used to help predict error, measuring error in particular. So every time we use, or almost every time we use a mathematical equation, there's going to be some error that creeps in due to measurement error. And as a concrete example of what I mean by that, suppose your goal is to calculate the area of a circle. There are maybe a few ways you could approach this, but by far the easiest method, at least to my mind, is to measure the radius. And then use the formula relating the radius and the area. The area of a circle is pi r squared. And I'm sure that as children, we did many examples where we're just told the circle has a radius of five inches, find its area. But, but this part of the problem where I say we measure the radius deserves some kind of comment. 
because how are we measuring a radius? Well, we're presumably using some kind of physical device, a ruler, let's say. That's, in fact, put that on the board. We're going to measure the radius using a ruler. Well, I don't know when the last time you looked at a ruler was, but rulers are accurate to about an eighth of an inch maybe a sixteenth of an inch at best. That's just because of the way that a ruler is marked. It will go from zero inches to one inch, and then it will have one half of an inch marked, and the quarter inches marked. and the eighth of an inch is marked. So in one sense it would, so I mean, you can't get information about one one thousandth of an inch using this ruler. You can get information of about an eighth of an inch. Because of that, you get this situation where you have to eyeball the measurement. You say that the radius is five and three eighths of an inch, but that's not the exact radius. It's just an approximation of the radius. It's the best you can do with the measuring tool you have available to you. So because we are, we can only eyeball the radius with this ruler, error has crept into our problem. That isn't the exact radius, it's our best approximation, but we are only approximating it. And now you use that radius to compute the area, but the error in the radius persists, right? If this radius is only an approximation, if this radius contains some error in it, and then you stick that approximation into the area formula, the area is also going to have error in it. It is going to inherit that error from the radius. There's error in the radius, and that will produce error in the area when you use the form the. So you ask the very natural question, How bad is this error likely to be? So we know that error is going to exist. At the same time, I mean, I keep talking about this error in the radius. 
it's not like the radius is one inch and we're saying it's 10 inches. The radius should be accurate to about one eighth of an inch. So we know that the area in the radius is not too bad. What about the error in the area. If we take this error in the radius, which isn't too bad, it should be accurate to an eighth of an inch, and we use it in this formula, will we get an area that is basically accurate, or will the error get worse and give us an area that's completely unused? That's the question that we are going to approach with the differentials. So we have an x value and a y value, and they are related via a function, y equals f of x. And due to measurement errors, our value of x is imprecise. Our value of x contains error in it. And because of that, the value of y we calculate is also going to contain error in it. The differential dy equals f prime of x dx is an attempt to address the problem we have been discussing. This dx, in the context of the differential, is the measurement error. And this dy is the error that you get in y due to measurement error in x. So going back to this problem, <laughs> We've eyeballed the radius. We think that the radius is five and three eighths of an inch. We know that there is error here, error in the radius. We're now going to try to use the differential to find the resulting error in the area. And the differential formula applied to this particular situation. Here's our function. Here's f of r. So the differential form to the is a dA equals f prime of r 
D R. And based on the test, most of us can take F prime of R without a lot of effort at this point. It's 2 pi R using the power rule. So this is the formula we get from the differential. And this formula, which I'll copy over here, is going to let us approximate the error in the area that we are going to get as a result of the error in the radius. And once you've taken the derivative and set this up, the differential becomes very plug and fade. Here's what I think the radius is. I think it's five and three eighths of an inch. This dr, remember, is the measurement error. And I think that this, um, that this ruler is accurate to an eighth of an inch. So I'm going to put that in as my maximum <coughs> measurement error. <coughs> and now, it's plug and fay. So two times not mean let's see. I'm on my calculator. Two times pi times the radius, which I think is five plus three divided by eight times the measurement error, which I've identified as an eighth of an inch. We get this all into our calculator and we press the enter key. And there is the answer. I think that the radius, sorry, I think that the area is going to have at worst this much error in it. I think that, <coughs> oh, sorry. I think that we would expect the area to be off by about 4.2215 square inches. It's, without any more context, it's hard to understand this answer. So we should try to contextualize this. I mean, is this a big error? Is this a small error? But does anybody have any questions about what we've done so far before I discuss that? Then let me get this written on the whiteboard. Four point two two one four. Four point two two one five. If I'm measuring, remembering this correctly which I am. <clears throat> so we have 
a measurement of the error we think we're going to get. But it's hard to contextualize. Is this a big error or is it a small error? I mean, if, if like the area of the circle were 50,000 square inches and it were accurate to 4.2215 square inches, that would be incredibly accurate. If the area of the circle were five inches, but were only accurate to 4.2215 inches, that would be unusably inaccurate. So based on that, it seems like maybe the first thing we want to do if we want to measure the bigger bigness or the smallness of this error is to ask, well, when we calculate the area, what area do we get? I mean, I'm talking about calculating the area that's something I haven't actually done yet. It's probably something that we ought to do. So, just plugging this into the calculator, pi times five plus three eighths square ninety point seven six two how many decimals am I keeping ninety point seven six two six So compared to 90.7626, um, 4.2215 doesn't appear to be an enormous amount of error. It might be helpful to get that as a percentage. The relative error gives the area as a percentage instead of just a straight number. And it's found in the way that percentages are found. You take the error over the computed value, and then you turn that fraction into a percent by multiplying by 100%. In this case, the relative error well, we got an error of 4.2215. Our computed area is 90.7626. Turn that into a percentage by multiplying by 100%. Gonna 
do this on my calculator. There's 90.7626. Now that it's entered, we can take a look. And our calculator will follow order of operations. I always think this looks kind of ghastly. You could put parentheses around the division, although it shouldn't be necessary. But it makes it look a little nicer. And we get an error of about 4.65%. Up to a point, we've just kicked the can down the road a little, it has to be admitted, because now the question then becomes, well, is 4.6511% a big error or a small error? And just as with the number itself, there's no really clear answer to that. It depends on the problem. Like I once had a student um, who worked in manufacturing airplane parts, and he was like, yeah, I mean, an error of even like 0.0001% would be catastrophic you'd have to get rid of that part. So in that context, this would be an enormous error. In other contexts, it might not be. There's no one-size-fits-all solution to that question. That brings us to the end of differentials, the end of this section, the end of this chapter, and the end of this class. Many endings. We'll pick up with chapter four next week.